The first thing I noticed about the GMK Tech Nook Box K12 was the size of the box. It's way larger than any Nook Box or mini PC I've unboxed so far, but once you crack it open, the PC itself is actually just a bit larger than the modern Nook format. It measures 155 by 150 by 80 millimeters and uses the same industrial size chassis as GMK Tech's Evo series with a brushed aluminum shroud wrapping around three sides of a plastic shell. Inside the box, you get the usual accessory pack, a 120 watt power supply, an HDMI cable, a vase mount adapter, and a thin two page user guide. The K12 is powered by the AMD Ryzen 7H255, though outside of China, it's usually just called the Ryzen 7 255. This is an eight core 16 thread Zen 4 CPU with a base clock of 3.8 gigahertz and a boost clock of up to 4.9 gigahertz. It includes 16 megabytes of L3 cache and typically has a configurable TDP of 35 to 54 watts, but in performance mode, the K12 can sustain a 65 watt TDP with short spikes up to 70 watts. For graphics, it's rocking integrated Radeon 780M graphics based on the RDNA 3 architecture with 12 compute units running at 2.6 gigahertz. Now, to make sense of AMD's naming chaos, basically the Hawkpoint H255 is the China-only variant of the Hawkpoint 8745HS, which it's itself is a refresh of the Phoenix 7840HS. Same Zen 4 architecture, GPU, and cache, just no NPU, and slightly lower clocks. Got it? <laughs> Good, let's move on. The version I'm reviewing comes preloaded with 32 gigabytes of DDR5 5600 SODIMM memory, user upgradable, and a one terabyte Crucial P3 Plus Gen 4 NVMe SSD installed in the primary PCIe 4x4 M.2 slot. There are two additional PCIe 4x2 M.2 slots, giving this thing support of up to 24 terabytes of total storage. Wireless connectivity is handled by a MediaTek Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2 M.2 adapter. Cooling wise, there's a 40 millimeter auxiliary ARGB fan to help move air through the chassis, while the CPU has its own cooling fan paired with a vapor chamber heat sink. Ports and expandability are seriously impressive. Up front, you've got a power button, one USB 2.0 type A, two 10 gigabit USB 3.2 gen two type A ports, a full featured 10 gigabit per second USB C port with display port alt mode and power delivery and a 3.5 millimeter headset jack. Around the back, the DC input, another headset jack, HDMI 2.1, and DisplayPoint 1.4 for up to 8K at 120 hertz output, another USB 2.0 type A, a third 10 gigabit USB A, dual 2.5 gigabit LAN ports, and a USB 4 port with 40 gigabit per second bandwidth, power delivery, and display output, bringing it to four display outputs total. And finally, yes, there's a PCI Gen 4x4 Oculic port for external GPU support, so you know we're gonna put that to the test. At the time of filming, the GMK Tech Nookbox K12 starts at $409 for the bare bones version. The configuration I'm testing with 32 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte SSD is priced at $549. I'll leave a link in the description so you can check the current pricing. Now that you know what the GMK Tech Nookbox K12 is, let's see what it can do. The K12 comes preloaded with Windows 11 Pro, but GMK Tech has made a small tweak to the installer. It skips the usual network requirement and lets you create a local account right away, as long as you don't plug in a wired LAN connection. Now, that kind of customization can sometimes raise a red flag, other mini PC brands have used similar tweaks as an excuse to inject bloatware, install non-standard software, or worse, slip in some malware. But in this case, everything looked cleaned. After the install, there was no extra bloat beyond the usual Windows fluff, and a full malware scan came back clean, so it seems like GMK Tech just wanted to streamline the setup process and make it easier for end users. You can still sign into a Microsoft account and sync your Windows profile if you want to do that for whatever reason. With the system up and running, it was time to see how the K12 stacks up against the competition. I ran my usual suite of performance tests comparing it to other mid-tier and high-end mini PCs, including the Ace Magic W1, which features the Western market version of the same CPU, the Ryzen 7 8745HS. 
Starting with raw CPU performance, the K12 scores a 936 in the Cinebench 2024 10-minute multi-core test, which is statistically neck and neck with the Ace Magic W1. Interestingly, it only falls about 3% behind the MSI DP21, which is running a desktop class Core i7-14700, and just 2.6 behind the 10-core M4 Mac Mini. It really doesn't start to fall off until we get into Zen 5 HX370 territory, or systems equipped with an Intel Ultra 9, or of course the 16-core Ryzen 9 7945HX. In the Cinebench single-core test, the K12 lands a score of 104 that puts it right in line with the other hawk point cpus but still at the bottom of the stack overall when it comes to single core performance moving to geekbench 6 multi-core the k12 again mirrors the w1 only about three percent off the ryzen 9 equipped geekcom a8 outpaces it by around six percent in the single core test, the Ryzen 7 255 trails slightly behind most of the pack, including the other Hawk Point based systems. Now, GPU compute performance is where things get a little weird. The K12 consistently scores lower than nearly every other test in the Geekbench GPU compute test, only beating the older UHD graphics found in the 12900HK. Despite having a higher sustained package power than the 8745HS, it still falls more than 6% behind it. I reran this test half a dozen times just to be sure, but the results held. That said, real world performance tells a more sensible story. In Photoshop, the K12 beat every system on the chart, except the creativity focused M4 Mac Mini, even edging out the Zen 5 powered B-Link Sear 9. More impressively, in Premiere Pro, the K12 basically wipes the floor with the rest of the lineup, again, aside from the Mac Mini, it even outperforms the Ryzen 9 HX370 by nearly 15%. A big reason for that is power. The R7255 in this unit holds a rock solid 65 watt package power under sustained mixed workloads, CPU, GPU, single core, multi core, you name it. And it does it without any signs of thermal or power throttling. Meanwhile, the rest of the systems in this class are either thermally limited, power limited, or both. You can see the same story play out in the Blender CPU render test where core count and sustained wattage win, the K12 hits 74 samples per second, only beating by the 20 core i7-14700, 12 core HX370, 10 core M4, and 16 core 7945HX. But when switching Blender render to the iGPU, the K12 lands back in the middle of the pack. It matches the 8745HS, but falls behind the rest, confirming weaker GPU compute numbers from earlier. In the ProSyan Office Productivity Benchmark, which simulates real-world multitasking across Microsoft Office apps, the K12 slips to the bottom of the chart. This is almost entirely a single core bursty heavy workload and the slower boost clocks of the 255H put it just barely ahead of the Ace Magic W1. Finally, for 3D graphics performance, the GMK Tech K12 scores 28351 in 3D Mark Night Raid. That's near the bottom of the stack, again, only beating out the UHD graphics of the 12900HK and nearly 7% behind the Ace Magic W1, despite both having Radeon 780M graphics. So, does that mean the K12 is weak for gaming? Well, we'll find out next, but first, let's talk about price to performance. Looking at current street prices, the K12 sits closer to the Ryzen 9 equipped Geekcom A8 than it does to the equivalently specced Ace Magic W1, it's only about $50 cheaper than the M4 Mac Mini, which is interesting. When I charted out the price of performance across the stack, the K12 lands squarely in the middle. It only clearly beats the i9-12900HK systems thanks to their much weaker integrated graphics, but compared to the W1, the K12 ends up about 30% higher in price to performance, while tying the Geekcom 8.8. Of course, price to performance is just one metric. What it doesn't account for are the intangibles, the stuff that 
adds real value depending on your workflow. The K12 has two additional M.2 slots, dual 2.5 gigabit LAN ports, four display outputs, USB 4 and OcuLink support. That kind of expandability could easily tip the scale depending on what you need from your PC. Speaking of OcuLink, that feature alone can completely shift the gaming experience on a mini PC like this. So I tested the GM K Tech K12, both as a standalone system and with an RX 9060 XT connected via the PCIe Gen 4x4 OcuLink port, showing both sets of the results side by side for each title. In Baldur's Gate 3, the K12's integrated Radeon 780M already holds its own, topping the charts aside from the RDNA 3.5 Radeon 890M in the B-Link Seer 9. It ties the Intel XE graphics of the Ultra 9 185H in the Geekom GT1 and outperforms the equivalent Hawkpoint systems like the Ace Magic W1 and the Geekom A8 by 18 to 22%. Now, one standout metric for the K12 across most of the games was its tighter frame time spread. The difference between average FPS and 1% lows was significantly smaller than the rest of the system, which translated into smoother, more stable gameplay, even during intense scenes. Now, with the RX 9060 XT connected over Oculink, the raw frame rate increase in this title wasn't dramatic, but that's because the game was now running at 1440p on higher ultra settings instead of 1080p low. So while the average FPS bump looked modest, the jump in resolution and visual quality was massive. Same story in Borderlands 3. On the integrated GPU, the K12 performed better than nearly everything except the Seer 9. This is a notoriously choppy benchmark, but the K12 delivered some of the smoothest gameplay I've seen from a mini PC. With the RX 9060XT connected, 1% lows remained impressively high despite the known PCIe by 4 bottleneck, and the game looked and played great at 1440p high. Counter-Strike 2 is always a bit of an oddball on these systems. Intel XE graphics usually do better, while AMD's iGPUs tend to be all over the place. That trend continues here. The K12 beat the Seer 9 in this test, but couldn't quite match the A8. When I ran the test again with the 9060 XT attached, still at 1080p low, the results showed classic CPU bottleneck behavior. Average FPS only increased by about 100, and 1% lows actually dropped a bit. That's likely due to the Oculent bottleneck and the game being extremely CPU bound. In Doom Eternal, the charts trend line mostly followed cost. The more expensive systems outpaced the K12 and the K12 beat the cheaper ones, but plugged the 9060 XT in and it became a whole different story. With ray tracing enabled, the K12 still pushed well over 120 FPS at 1440p ultra. There was a little micro stutter, probably due to memory management over the limited Oculink bandwidth, but gameplay was smooth overall. Shadow of the Tomb Raider tends to lean in AMD's favor, so the K12 outperformed the Intel XE equipped GT1 and wasn't far behind the Seer 9. It also delivered some of the smoothest iGPU gameplay on the chart. With the RX 9060 XT installed, the game stayed playable at 1440p high, though smoothness did take a slight hit, again likely due to the Oculink bandwidth saturation. In my small pool of games, the K12 ends up just 2 FPS behind the $900 Geekom GT1 and only about 15% behind the flagship Zen 5 powered B-Link Seer 9. At the same time, it outperforms the similarly specced Ace Magic W1 by 22%. That kind of result comes down to two key things, power and cooling. The K12 is able to hold a sustained 65 watt package power without throttling, allowing the CPU and iGPU to operate at full potential throughout longer workloads. Add in full PCI 4x4 access, and this is one of the very few systems on the chart that can realistically scale up to true 1440p high-end gaming through external GPU expansion. And that's exactly what I did. With the RX 9060 XT connected via Oculink, I was able to play Black Myth Wukong, Cyberpunk 2077, and Warhammer 40K Space Marine 2, games that simply aren't playable on the integrated graphics alone. Now, with a sustained 65 watt package power, you might assume the thermals, or especially the system noise, would be a problem, but you'd be wrong. Well, 
Well, mostly. While the CPU itself runs hot, consistently sitting between 90 and 95 degrees Celsius, the chassis doesn't. The exterior of the PC barely gets warm to the touch, which is impressive considering the thermal load. That 90 to 95 C range gives us a delta of about 72 degrees Celsius. And yeah, for us old school builders, that seems borderline scary. Sustained temps in the mid 90s, that used to be what you'd see right before something let out the magic smoke. But these modern mobile SOCs are designed to run at higher temps, and according to AMD anyway, they can do so safely without risking long-term degradation. The Ryzen 7 255's TJ Maxx is 100 degrees Celsius, and during all my testing, it never hit that ceiling. In fact, it never once thermal throttled, and more impressively, it didn't power throttle either. I can't say that about most mini PCs I've tested. Almost all of them scale back speed at some point just to maintain their PL1. Not this one. And despite running that hot, the K12 stays surprisingly quiet. Even under full load, the fan peaked at just 48 decibels. That's more of a low whoosh than a high pitched whine. Totally acceptable whether you're gaming, working, or just browsing in a quiet space. Now, if that kind of heat makes you uncomfortable, you have options. You can dial back the TDP in the UEFI to the standard 54 watt cap by selecting balanced mode or drop it all the way down to 35 watts in quiet mode. These presets reduce the TDP and lower the fan speed, so even under load, the CPU still hits and holds temps in the low to mid 90s, but thanks to lower power demand, the fan slows to a point of basically inaudible. On the flip side, if you want to prioritize cooling, you can tweak the fan curve manually in the UEFI and crank it all the way up to 100%. It's nice having that level of control baked right in, especially for a mini PC running this much hardware in such a compact space. Now, typically, I find at least a few issues or compromises with the mini PCs I review, but honestly, I've got zero complaints with the K12. For non-Mac users, this is probably the best value mid-tier mini PC I've tested in 2025 so far. Sure, it's not at the very top of the price to performance chart. Beyond raw performance, what really makes the K12 shine is that expandability. Three M.2 slots, dual 2.5 gigabit, USB 4 and oculent, four video outputs, even small details like having an audio jack on both the front and back make a difference. I can plug in a headset without having to disconnect my speakers. That kind of convenience goes a long way. What really sets this apart though is that GMK Tech actually treated the mobile SOC like a proper desktop part. They matched the TDP, matched it with a capable cooler that doesn't sound like a drone sitting on your desk, and still gave users the ability to scale things down with a simple switch in the BIOS. It's one of these rare cases where the mini PC feels like a real desktop alternative, not just a repurposed laptop board in a box. If you're looking for a mid-tier, well-rounded mini PC as a desktop replacement, something that can handle everyday computing, light to moderate creative or development workloads, or even some light gaming with lots of expandability and room to grow, I'd put the GMK Nookbox K12 right at the top of the list. If you got something out of this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more independent, in-depth hardware reviews like this, consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.